This is Trump on Earth. I'm Julie Grant. Word leaked a few weeks ago that the Environmental Protection Agency is poised to finalize a rule to limit the types of scientific studies that can be used to create new regulations. The proposal is named Strengthening Transparency in Regulatory Science, and it would require public health researchers to release their raw scientific data in order for their work to be considered when EPA sets regulations. Would you be willing to enroll yourself or your child in a study about toxins in the water, air, or food if you knew EPA would take your data and share it with the world? These regulations dictate things like how much pollution companies can release into the air and water. The rationale for the rule goes like this. These studies are not transparent. Researchers currently can't release their raw data because it contains confidential information, things like personal health data, names, and home addresses. The proposed rule would only allow the use of studies that make all data publicly available for anyone to analyze. Former EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt first pitched this new rule back in 2018 as a way to make the agency's decision-making more, quote, transparent, objective, and measurable. The rule will ensure that the regulatory science underlying agency action is fully transparent and that underlying scientific information is publicly available in a manner sufficient to independently validate uh, the science. The version of the rule leaked to the New York Times last month shows a change from previous drafts. The previous version would have only applied to a small section of public health research, but under the leaked version of the rule, scientists would have to disclose all raw data, including confidential medical records, in order for the EPA to consider the study. When the rule was first proposed, the agency received nearly 600,000 comments, the vast majority of them in opposition. One of those came from Dr. Mary Rice. She's a pulmonary and critical care physician at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, where she treats patients with lung disease. She also studies the effects of air pollution on lung health. On November 14th, Dr. Rice was one of five scientists to testify before the House Science Committee on the proposed rule. As a doctor, I would do my patients a disservice if I ignored a huge chunk of the scientific literature in making my medical decisions. And the same would be true for EPA if it ignored evidence in making decisions about toxins in our environment. Hi, Dr. Rice. Thanks for taking a break from seeing your patients to talk with us. Thank you for having me, Julie. So broadly speaking, if the rule that we're talking about went into effect, how would your work and research be affected? Well, it probably would not be affected much at all, at least not initially, uh, because this rule does not really interfere with how the research is conducted. What it interferes with is how the EPA uses published studies to make decisions about health standards after the research has been completed. So to give you an example of my own research, I have a study of uh, patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. And in that study, the study participants carry air quality monitors around with them every day. And those air quality monitors have GPS trackers that identify where they're located at any given time. And in order to add that piece to my study, I had to take extreme measures to make sure that nobody who ever got that code could figure out who the study participants were. So I worked with the vendor to scramble the GPS data. And then after I collect all those coordinates, I unscramble that data behind a firewall so that if anyone were ever to get it, they couldn't make sense of the GPS coordinates. They couldn't figure out where the study participants were located. And so... To comply with this rule, I would have to make all the data of my study participants available in some kind of public database. And that would include their medical histories, the fact that they have COPD, where they're located on a given day from the GPS data. And in the consent form that they signed, I guaranteed that I would protect their private data. So I wouldn't be able to put that kind of information on a public database because is protected. It's protected by the process uh, that I went through in order to be able to conduct the study in the first place. So really the end result would be that that particular study would be one that the EPA would not consider. And that would really be the case for most research that involves real people living in the real world, going about their daily lives. And what do you think is important about that in terms of, I mean, there's two things there. Why is it important that data be private, certain data, and 
how does it impact things if a study like that is not usable by EPA? Well, that's the piece that I'm most concerned about. The research we're talking about is is the research that involves real people, real children and adults, and how pollution affects their health. And so what this rule is, it's, it's a process barrier that would block that kind of research from informing EPA policies. And these are the kinds of studies that have shown things like air pollution as a cause of premature death in older adults. It's the kind of research that's shown that air pollution is linked to worse lung function in kids and slower lung function growth as they get older. A well-designed study is one that collects a lot of information about people uh, that could confound the association between pollution and health. Things like habits, like whether or not you smoke uh, or whether or not you drink a lot of alcohol. But the studies that collect that kind of information, well, that's private information. That's sensitive information that no one participating in those studies would want to have shared. You wouldn't want your mental health history to be shared with the public or your smoking history, for example. And so we have very good processes in place to protect that kind of information. And this transparency rule, the way it is designed, would prevent the EPA from using those very well-designed studies. And that's what worries me most. No, when we hear from the EPA, the agency says, and this is a quote, science transparency does not weaken science, quite the contrary, by requiring transparency, scientists will be required to publish hypothesis and experimental data for other scientists to review and discuss, requiring the science to withstand skepticism and peer review. So I wonder what your response is to that. You know, they the EPA is calling this an increase in transparency, but it seems like you see it differently. Yes. The key issue is that this rule creates a barrier against the use of science that can't meet the EPA's requirement. The American Thoracic Society and the scientific community broadly very much supports mechanisms that promote data sharing among scientists while protecting the privacy of study participants. Um, Maybe it would actually be helpful if I I gave you an analogy as a doctor. Yeah. When doctors are taking care of patients, they are considering all different kinds of studies. Some are well-designed, some are uh, just case reports. And doctors have to make medical decisions based on the best available evidence that they have at hand. And uh, over time, as more evidence emerges, medical practices change. You would want your doctor, or I I should say that when I take care of patients, I do my best to look at all the available evidence and to make my medical decisions based on the best available evidence that I have at hand to make decisions about what drug to give, you know, how to manage a particular patient in the ICU. And really the same applies to the EPA and the decisions that it makes about our public health. We would want our EPA to use all of the available evidence, the weight of the evidence, and then making decisions about health standards, and not creating a rule that limits the use of certain studies. And that's the piece that the scientific community is objecting to. You evoked the tobacco industry in your testimony. I want to emphasize that this process barrier is a familiar and sneaky strategy to discredit science that was pushed by big tobacco in the 1990s. As mentioned earlier... And included a letter from the tobacco industry from the 1990s. Could you explain the connection there and why you wanted to make that connection? Yes. In fact, what EPA is proposing comes straight out of the playbook of the tobacco industry and its attempts to discredit research findings that link environmental tobacco smoke to health problems. Uh, And as part of my testimony, I shared an internal memo that was written in 1996 by uh, tobacco lawyer Chris Horner. And in that memo, he laid out a detailed strategy for discrediting scientific findings. And he advised R.J. Reynolds to focus on, quote, process as opposed to scientific substance, because attacking the substance of the science that secondhand tobacco smoke is bad for health would be a, quote, public relations nightmare, end quote. 
Our approach is one of addressing process as opposed to scientific substance and global applicability to industry rather than focusing on any single industrial sector. Thus the examples of questionable science to justify these standards. Congress must require those examples serve as the test cases. If you review the memo, it's really uncanny. The same words are in this memo as are written all throughout the transparency and regulatory science proposed rule. Transparency, use of sound science, replication of science. We envision a program using contemporary studies and reports to illustrate how the agency skews its results in the pre-regulation stage to create set, reviewable science procedures. We need another meeting to hammer out the presentation to the two referenced audiences and reach consensus with you on the issues and approach we intend to pursue. Until we speak with you further on this, happy holidays. So I think it's pretty clear that this proposed rule, it's not about improving transparency. It's about creating a process barrier to discredit or ignore science about potentially harmful health effects of exposures that are found to be inconvenient. So do you know any scientists or epidemiologists who are in favor of this proposed rule? So I do not. And in fact, what I thought was interesting at the hearing. It's an honor to hear from such a distinguished panel uh, of scientists, and this rule has inspired... Was that none of the witnesses were in favor. They were all scientists. And I'd like to each panelist to answer very briefly, uh, basically yes or no. Do you support the strengthening transparency and regulatory science rule as written? No. No. More information and clarification is needed. Not as written. No. Thank you very much. Uh, the EPA's proposed and uh, the minority witness, who is the uh, d the director of the Center for Open Science, Brian Nosek, he was also not in favor of the rule. And all of the scientists on the panel were were supportive of mechanisms to improve transparency, and all of them felt that the EPA should use the best available science in its decision making, and it shouldn't be ignoring any well conducted research just because it can't be fully released to the public. And so who is in favor of this rule? You know, like who's to benefit? You've, you've talked about who's to, you've, you've talked about what's at stake, but sort of like who's to benefit here? No, I think it's very clear that this proposal is not favored by scientists, but it is supported by certain industry groups. And some of them uh, do pollute the environment and have a stake in the outcome of environmental regulations. And one concern that the American Thoracic Society has is that at its worst, this proposal could deliver sensitive health research data straight to the potentially misleading manipulations of special interest groups. And those special interest groups and industry groups would then be free to report their alternative findings without having to undergo peer review like the scientific community does when they publish their findings. And they would have access to the, these data without having to demonstrate that they have the skills and appropriate resources to analyze the data and interpret it in an unbiased manner. And all of these findings would be on the same playing field in terms of informing EPA policy. And that's a, a frightening thought. Now, when the rule was first proposed, um, it was by then Administrator Scott Pruitt. He talked about a replication crisis, referring to scientific studies that can't be reproduced. And then in September, the current head of EPA, Andrew Wheeler, said this to a congressional committee. Good science is science that can be replicated and independently validated, science that holds up to scrutiny. That is why we're moving forward to ensure that the science supporting agency decisions is transparent and available for evaluation by the public and stakeholders. What are your thoughts on this idea that good science requires the ability to reproduce studies? Well, sometimes studies are not replicated uh, when they're repeated in a different setting by a different scientific team. In fact, that happens all the time. And in medical care, sometimes our decisions are, are swayed very quickly by a single drug trial that has a very different outcome from what has been previously found. But in EPA policy, historically, Decisions have not been made based on one or two studies. We're talking about, in many cases, hundreds of studies that inform EPA decision making. That is replication. So when you see the same findings over and over uh, by different scientific teams looking in different populations, in the vast majority of cases, the same conclusion is reached. I would not call that a crisis. I would say that that's consistent scientific evidence. 
Uh, and one example of where the scientific evidence has been particularly consistent is uh, the link between particulate matter exposure and mortality. In the case of particulate matter, in this most recent policy assessment, for example, the EPA uh, looked at the link between mortality and particulate matter exposure, and they relied on 21 U.S. and Canadian studies. They looked at 10 different studies looking at particulate matter and lung cancer, uh, seven studies on respiratory mortality, 14 on particulate matter exposure and cardiovascular mortality. So these findings have been seen in large numbers of very well-designed studies. These are just the United States and Canadian studies. There are many more studies that have been conducted in Europe and Asia that have also consistently found the link between particulate matter exposure and mortality. So I think replication is very important. And historically, the EPA has made policies based on data that is very well replicated. And um, the particulate matter standard in specifically has historically been very much based on this mortality data because it has been so compelling and consistent. So you're saying, if I'm catching you right, that you don't need to call back every person in a given study to be able to replicate it as long as different studies are coming to similar conclusions over time. Yes, I would say that when the same findings are seen over and over again in, in different studies using different tools in different populations, that is a form of replication. Reanalysis of data also has a role, and um, there have been cases of, uh, of controversy in environmental health science. So one important example is the Particulate Matter Mortality Association has been questioned over the last 10 to 20 years. And at one point, uh, an outside institution was brought in so that the data really could be reanalyzed in a way that protected the privacy of the study participants. Uh, so the, uh, the data from the Harvard Six City study and the American Cancer Society studies that showed that particulate matter was linked to death, they were reanalyzed in a way that protected the privacy of the study participants. Outside scientists were brought in, and they reanalyzed the data, and they came to the same conclusion as the original scientific publications, that particulate matter exposure was associated with premature mortality in these two very large studies. But what worries me is that this particular rule says that all studies need to be reanalyzed by EPA in order to be considered. That's just a huge amount of work. I honestly, I can't really fathom how that would even happen. Yeah, you mentioned the Harvard Six City study. Mm -hmm. We've been hearing that this rule could invalidate studies like that, considered bedrock public health studies that have been used to craft regulations like the Clean Air Act. Well, can you talk about, you, you did already a little bit, but what, what's the significance of that study, the Harvard Six City study? Well, historically, the Harvard Six City study has drawn a lot of attention because it was really a landmark study. It was published in 1993, and it showed that in six U.S. cities, exposure to pollution, particulate matter pollution, was associated with premature mortality. That was one of the first really big studies that had shown that link. Uh, many have credited that study with uh, the, the tighter regulations on particulate matter, the improvement in air quality that we, we have experienced as a country. But the Harvard Six City study is just one study. And most scientists would tell you that no major decisions should be based on just one study. And in, in fact, they weren't. The particulate matter standards, the, the tightening of those standards were not informed by just that one study. There have been many more studies subsequent to that. And most recently, there was a study published looking at Medicare data and showing that both short and long-term exposure to particulate matter is associated with premature mortality in the Medicare population, so people aged over 65. So it's not controversial that PM2.5 is associated with premature mortality. That's really my point. And, and that study has drawn a lot of attention because it was one of the first ones, but it is by no means the only one. I mean, that's, that's a finding that has been replicated over and over again. It's just not controversial anymore. It really shouldn't be. So the New York Times reported that the studies like the six city studies could be invalidated because the individual health data is not publicly available. But then later in a news release, the EPA said the reporter for the Times got it all wrong, saying the six city studies would not be retroactively affected. 
I just wonder what what's going on here? Why are we hearing these alternate stories? Well, my interpretation of that discussion, obviously I can't speak on behalf of the EPA, but I was there. Uh, I listened to the EPA uh, spokesperson's testimony uh, during the House hearing. And the EPA's point is that this transparency, this proposed transparency rule would apply to future rules. So not, for example, the PM standard that was set previously. However, what was said during the hearing was that since this proposed rule would apply to future regulations, it actually could invalidate prior studies like the Harvard Six Cities study when they are used to inform future policies. So, for example, the PM standard is revisited every five plus years and all the science gets looked at again. So I mentioned the Medicare study, that's looking at the pollution levels we see today. When the Harvard Six Cities study was conducted in the 1990s, exposure levels were much higher. But the point is that this rule would allow the EPA to only use studies whose underlying data are completely available to the public and then also reanalyzed. So this would apply to the Harvard Six Cities study, but also all the other studies I was referring to. They would have to be able to meet those requirements in order to re- inform future regulations. So, and I, so I'm just trying to put the, some different pieces together. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think this was, you know, another point that was made when the Times, others have also reported that the new rule would quote require scientists to disclose all their raw data, including confidential medical records. And again, the EPA said in response that that's not accurate. Uh, the press release from the agency said the EPA maintains protecting confidential personal information just as other federal health agencies regularly do. The reporter clearly does not understand the terms in the context of science transparency. So can you help us figure out what's going on here? What's yeah. Yeah. So part of this gets at what is really the meaning of quote underlying data. So in my field in air pollution research, uh, the underlying data about environmental exposure It all really depends on the location, right? Where does the person live or where does the person work or go to school? And that location is used to assign exposure to pollution. What's also really important is dates. So for example, in a study that's looking at mortality or death, uh, we're looking at the exposure in that location on the dates leading up to that death. When that person was at that location, are important because that determines what the exposure was. So you need dates and you need location to do an environmental health study, looking at outdoor pollution at least. So to actually make the quote underlying data public in a way that could be verified and double checked would really have to require, it would have to involve sharing information about dates and location. And that's protected information. I wanted to make another point, which is that I believe that part of the EPA's response, uh, part of the argument there was that there are mechanisms to de-identify data. And there there are. The environmental health research community is, is concerned also because in our field, it may actually be especially easy to re-identify study participants because of this reliance on dates and location. So to, to just give you an example, um, there was a publication by Sweeney in, in 2017 Uh, that used the data from an air pollution study that was done in California. And they used a fully HIPAA-compliant de-identified data set from that study. Uh, So it met all the federal requirements for de-identification. And what the investigators then did is they used publicly available databases to try to piece it together and try to figure out who the study participants were. And they were actually able to identify one in four study participants. That's a lot. Imagine what the long-term implications could be of a a data breach where the EPA insisted on on putting de-identified data on a public database and someone could figure out who a a 25% or more of the study participants were, what their mental health problems are, what their income levels are. And the consequences of that could be devastating for the study participants It has implications for employers, for health insurance policies, potentially. It would also be awful for the future of the field, um, because imagine 
how willing you might be to sign up for an environmental health study or to, to enroll your child in an environmental health study that's looking at pollutants in the air, or the water, if you knew that the EPA would take the data of that study and make it fully available to the public. Yeah. And do you have any patients specifically, you know, any individual patient you were thinking about when you were preparing your testimony? Well, we all breathe the same outdoor air, and it turns out that on average, everybody's lung function is a little bit worse when it's more polluted outside. Uh, and most of us don't notice these very tiny changes in our lung function. The same's not true for my patients who have lung disease. And I am very concerned about the possibility that the EPA could actually roll back some of the protections uh, that my patients have to protect them from the harmful effects of air pollution. Because if anything, the most recent research has shown that the pollution levels that we're exposed to today are still harmful. I hear it in my patients. I see it in my clinic. Uh, just to give you an example, there's a young man that I'm caring for who has severe asthma. And when he moved to Boston, he has just had the hardest time in the summertime. Whenever we had those really hot summer days, he ends up in the emergency room with wheeze and cough. It's interfered with his ability to keep a job here in the city. And I always wonder if his symptoms are due to ozone smog because he's not allergic to grass pollen, which can be a problem in the summer. And so the last thing he needs is to have the EPA ignoring the latest evidence on ozone and how it's harmful for respiratory health. You know, he needs an EPA that looks at all of the data, that looks at the most recent evidence that shows that we're still seeing premature mortality, we're still seeing asthma admissions and ozone levels that are within the current standard. You know, my patients really deserve clean air standards that protect their health, and they really depend on the EPA to look at all of the data that's out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and, and we're trying to get a sense of, you know, how big of a deal this particular rule, proposed rule is. And on this podcast, you know, every week we're talking about another regulation being rolled back or another rule being put forward, a new climate report with dire news. And so we're just wanting to hear from you about how this rule stands out or if it stands out as different from what's happened in other administrations. Is this something that you think is broader or bigger somehow? Yes. I think this rule is particularly scary because we're not talking about one pollutant or one policy or one health standard. This is a rule that would cut across the entire rulemaking process for all types of EPA policy. And so it can affect all kinds of decisions about pollutants that affect the health of our kids and the health of all adults. I focused a lot in our discussion on respiratory health because I'm a pulmonologist, but there are so many health effects of pollution, and we depend on the EPA to set standards that protect our health. Some of these health effects are, are things like childhood leukemias, adult cancers, effects on air pollution on the heart and the brain and the endocrine system, and this is really far-reaching. And this rule or this proposed rule, I should say, it introduces a process barrier that would cut way back on the amount of research that the EPA would consider in its rulemaking. And once that bureaucratic machinery is put in place to block or obstruct the use of science in EPA policy, it might be really difficult to undo. I'm very concerned that the implications of such a change for our health and, and the next generation could be extensive and even irreversible. Well, I guess we'll have to leave it there. Dr. Mary Rice, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Julie. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this. Dr. Rice is a pulmonary and critical care physician at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Thanks for listening to Trump on Earth. If you like our show, please consider supporting us through Patreon. Just go to patreon.org slash Trump on Earth. You can find us online at trumponearth.org and anywhere you get your podcasts. Write us a review and tell your friends. The podcast is supported by the Robert F. Schumann Foundation. Our producer and digital editor is Andy Kubis. Kathy Nauer is our executive producer. I'm Julie Grant.